There we go. There we go. Good evening. This is uh, May 17th, 2016, the Hampton Municipal Budget Committee meeting. Um, if everybody would rise for the Pledge of Allegiance and stay standing afterwards. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I would ask that everybody remain standing oh, um, right. for a moment of silence and recognition of firefighter paramedic Kyle Jameson with Hampton, who is an active firefighter, um, succumbed to his battle with cancer on Sunday. Uh, he was 34 years old, yeah. and he is uh, survived by his wife, Christine, his son, Liam, and his mother, Sheila. I ask that all, all bow your heads in a moment of silence. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, sticking to the agenda, uh, I'm going to go around and have everybody do an auditory roll call as our secretary is remote. Um, and after the roll call, I would invite our guest to introduce themselves and um, the company they're with or the business they're representing. And then we will, um, I will then take it back from you. I'll explain why they're here and how we're going to go throughout the process tonight. So, Ms. Bryan. Ginny Bridal from Hampton School Board. Regina Barnes from the Board of Selectmen. Michael Pierce. Brian Lopin. Mike Pluff. Nick Bridal, Chair. Stephen LeBranch. Jones. Daniel Augustine. Steve Anderson. Mary Louise Wolsey. <coughs> Stephen Buckley of NHMA. Margaret Burns, NHMA. And welcome. Um, for the record, I would just like to announce the absence of Mr. Sonny Kravitz and Mr. Bob Ladd, and that is for the record. Excused or unexcused? Um, you need to note that. Excused is Mr. Ladd, Mr. Kravitz is unexcused. Um, as we discussed last meeting, the NHMA is here this month to give a budget presentation. Um, they gave one of these presentations last year. Um, it's about the municipal budget process, and they will come in and explain to the people who don't have any experience or maybe need a refresher course in the budget process um, how, it, how it goes about what we're going to be doing here uh, in the next year. It's very informative. I went to an elected officials um, seminar with them. Well, a couple weeks ago in Hudson, and which was an eight-hour day, not just related to budget, but uh, other stuff, which was very, very informative. And I found out that that was uh, eligible to all elected officials in town. I would recommend, I've asked them to do a little plug for that seminar. I would recommend that uh, anybody that's on this committee look into attending one of those. I think they have three left this year. Um, if not, next year they'll be coming out with another round of those um, seminars. And I do encourage everybody to go attend those because they were, uh, I know Ms. Barnes, you attended one. Um, it's very, very informative uh, from an elected official standpoint. Before I turn the meeting over to NHMA, they have asked me to have everybody sign this form <coughs> stating that you are here and you received this training for them. This is just for their records. I'm going to pass it around, and if you would be so kind as to fill it out, once everybody filled it out, if it would make its way to our guests, um, that would be wonderful. Um, at this time, we're going to be holding off any questions um, after the meeting um, while they are here, and we have some face-to-face -face time, so I'm going to ask that everybody holds their questions to the end. Um, that being said, I will turn the floor over to you, Stephen and Margaret. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the Budget Committee, thank you very much for having us here. Myself, in services counsel, Margaret Brown, staff attorney, we are the legal services department of NHMA, and we want to thank the town, the Budget Committee, and all the citizens of Hampton for being members of NHMA to help support the programs that we do, such as this. A um, little thing about what's in your packet. Just want to go over a few things. One of those is a new flyer that we're putting out this year. It's this flyer, which has a banner at the top. So if you're a new public official, one of the things we urge you to do is check out this flyer and do three things. Number one, uh, subscribe to our electronic newsletter, news, newsletter, news link. 
And number two, subscribe to our electronic <coughs> newsletter called the Legislative Bulletin. And number three, if possible, get your hands on the uh, Town of City magazine, which is sent out to the town. Uh, it's also available online. Three things I think all new public officials should think about doing. Um, second thing I want to mention, we do have annually a budget and finance workshop. There's a green save the date flyer that talks about that. And that's a full day devoted just to budget and finance. And certainly would be something that perhaps a budget committee member would want to attend. If you go to that program, not only do you receive the materials that the speakers hand out, you also get the law, of, the basic law of budgeting. Again, our essential uh, volume on the law of how to uh, carry out the, the budgeting and the laws relating to budgeting. And finally, I just want to remind you that we do have an annual conference where are also chock-a-block full of programming. That is a save-to-date flyer. It's yellow. Uh, the annual conference is November 16th and 17th this year in Manchester. And, and just to follow up on what the chairman mentioned about our local officials workshop, we do them every year. Uh, we have a local official workshop which any elected or appointed official and town uh, employees can attend. The next one is Thursday in Whitefield. Uh, the, the following week, it's on Wednesday the 25th in Ossipee at the Carroll County Complex. And then the last local officials workshop is going to be held in Concord at HMA's offices on 25 Triangle Park Drive on June 4th. So there's plenty of opportunity if someone wants to. It's free. Uh, you get breakfast and lunch, and you also get our 320-odd page booklet on all of New Hampshire laws that applies to municipalities called Knowing the Territory. So <laughs> encourage you know, anyone who's a local elected official and staff and, and employees of a town to attend the local officials' workshop. So tonight is the municipal budget process, and the agenda that we have set for you, uh, we, we find more and more when Margaret, do, uh, Margaret and I do these programs, we realize the right to know law is essential to understanding how a community does its job. So we've inserted some slides on the right to know law. We're going to be covering general principles of uh, budgeting, uh, key budget concepts, the budget committee, and then also talk about fund sources. So the right to know law. Um, I guess the essential understanding that we would like to bring to you is to understand that any time a public body meets as a quorum to acts on matters within its jurisdiction, that's a public meeting and any public meeting must be preceded by notice to the public of the date, time, and place of the meeting and give permission to the public to attend and tape record and videotape and if you deem it appropriate, depending upon your rules of procedure, allow members of the public to participate. So that's kind of an essential component of every public body. Um, and it also recognizes um, that there are certain activities you do as a meeting at a public body that may not be a meeting. So if a public body is doing collective bargaining discussions or meeting with uh, legal counsel or, or uh, having a, a, a circulation of draft documents, that's not a public meeting. So again, um, meetings of a public body, a quorum of a public body, subject to notice to the public and opportunity for the public to be available to participate. Um, so a lot of times we're asked the question, what is a public body? So it's a legislative body, governing board, commission, or any committee or subcommittee. So certainly I think you would understand that any statutory body, such as the budget committee, which is created by statute, is a public body. But it can also be an advisory committee created by the select board. My wife sat on an advisory committee in my hometown. We were looking at trying to revise our sign ordinance, a, a, a common occurrence these days given some recent rulings from our U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, and that is an advisory group to the uh, select board, but it's also a public body. So any uh, legislative body, governing board body, uh, or any committee or subcommittee of a public body is a public body subject to the duty to give notice of its meetings and to let the public participate. And this comes from my hometown, the town of Bow. So when the select board of the town of Bow created a public safety building uh, committee to look into building a new safety pub uh, sa public safety complex, let me ask if that sounds familiar to you. Um, almost every town and city I know of is dealing with perhaps building a new public safety complex. That subcommittee is also a public body. It has the same duty, uh, which one of which I left out, um, which I should address is not only you have to give notice of your meetings and let the public attend, but you also have to keep minutes of your meetings. Um, 
So as I've already discussed, <coughs> a, a meeting is a public body meeting as a quorum on matters within its jurisdiction, but it also could potentially happen, and this is one of the areas a public body or members thereof to be careful about, it could happen where it, the meeting it takes place in person or by telephone or electronic communication. So you have to be cautious when you're holding uh, discussions by email, which as a member of a whole board you probably should avoid, uh, that you have uh, the occasion when you send an email to everyone on a public body, you could have an occasion where you'd slip into a sequential conversation, which is uh, an improper public meeting, a meeting which is the public can't attend, so it would be an improper public meeting. Um, so as I've already indicated, uh, meetings under the right to know law or a quorum of a public body are subject to the right of the public to attend. Just to emphasize, because we get this question a lot, can anyone walk into a public meeting and record? Yes. Do they have to get permission? No. Uh, can they take their recorder and put it on the desk where the select board is meeting? Yes. Can they videotape? Yes. Um, now, there are no obligations for a public body to give people the right to speak, but you might allow people to speak or be required to do so. P budget committees hold public hearings. Clearly, the public is going to speak at a public hearing. But you could have rules of procedure that would say, under certain circumstances, we'll have a public comment period. And if you do have those public comment periods, and if they're in your rules of procedure, one thing to keep in mind, and I always emphasize this, under the right to know law, if you have a meeting procedure rule that says the public has the right to speak at a public comment period, there's a sentence in the right to know law that says, if you have that rule, and it's part of your public meeting rules, you've in effect created your own right to know law that applies in Hampton, that is enforceable as if it was part of the right to know law. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would just say that I think it's a good idea to have public comment periods, uh, but uh, if you do have a rule of procedure where the public comment is allowed, I think you should structure it and say uh, it should be addressing an item on the agenda, uh, and if you want to speak on something other than agenda item, you can do so, but you have to ask beforehand. Uh, and you limit the time period that people can speak. Two, three, five minutes. Five minutes is tops, probably. Uh, and um, uh, I would also emphasize when you were talking about, the, you know, managing public meetings, a public body has the right to manage its meetings so it can get its business done. So people are not allowed to use disruptive speech to thwart your uh, ability to get your job done. Um, as I've already said, email as a meeting is something that can happen. So if you accidentally have a circumstance where one member of the uh, budget committee sends an email to every other member of the budget committee saying, you know, I think that particular uh, purchase that the select board was talking about at the last meeting should have been a subject of an RFP or some kind of public bidding process, you now have uh, a potentially illegal public, non-public session, a public session of a meeting or that's not available for the public to attend, but it's the action the, the action of the board is happening by email. So what we always encourage you to do, if for some reason you're going to have a discussion that has to be transmitted to the whole board, it's done by staff. The staff sends it out to all the members of the board so that it, it appears as if the Probably email has gone through the, with the, the blind CC section of the, of the email. You don't send it to everyone so everyone can see their email. You just send it so that only the individual thinks they receive it. And so if the person hits reply all, which is the most dangerous button as far as I'm concerned <laughs> in your email systems, uh, they don't doesn't get sent out to all the members of the budget committee. So um, it's an area that, to be cautious about and we encourage the spoke and the wheel system. So you have a spoke, uh, is the, uh, the town hall, town administrator, the secretary to the board that sends an email out to everybody else and the communication only goes back to her, not to everyone else. And that avoids that you know, illegal sequential communication process. Now, uh, there, is, there are procedures and, and a lot of boards did this before the statute was changed, but there is a procedure now where if you have a member who needs to participate remotely, you can adopt a rule, a, a meeting bylaw, that regulates how someone can do that. So if they're in Florida during the winter and you want to have that person or uh, needs to participate on a matter or is taken away because of the death in the family, but they still want to participate, you could have a procedure rule that allows them to do that. Um, the board should adopt a procedure rule. Uh, you have to be sure that there's a quorum present physically where the meeting's being held. 
Uh, the member who's going to participate has to be able to be heard by everyone in the room, and everything said in the room has to be heard by the person who's participating remotely. The reason why the person participating remotely can't just be for the convenience of the member, it has to be because it's impractical for the person to be there. Mm -hmm. So if they were taken, uh, they had to take care of their aging mother out in California for a couple of weeks, that would be a reason of impracticality. Uh, and ultimately, when you do a process like this, um, all votes that are taken with someone participating remotely have to be done by roll call vote. So it's something that could make it easier in certain circumstances when a member can't be present. And finally, of course, uh, just needs to be emphasized, you have to have public meeting minutes. So when you have a public meeting, you have to have minutes. Now, one of the things that I always try to encourage people to understand is you, you don't have to have, you know, elaborate, detailed, transcript-like meeting minutes. The, the statute only requires you to list in the minutes of the members present, people participating in the meeting, a summary of the subject that were discussed, and decisions that were reached. Those, that's the minimum requirement of a right to know law public meeting minutes. And they are required to be produced within five business days of your meeting. Um, so you can certainly think about having the, your secretary uh, or other recording person prepare the meeting minutes. Uh, you don't have necessarily a need to approve minutes by a board because, in fact, the idea of approving minutes is not in the right to know law. I think the minutes should be produced by staff, and then at the next meeting that the board is available, if a board member thinks it necessary, they can say, Mr. Chairman, I would wish to amend the meeting minutes, and that amendment could be reflected in the meeting minutes of that meeting. Um, and that's just the best way we think is the way to proceed to comply with the law and get the meeting minutes prepared within the five minutes, five business days you're required. Um, so uh, that's just a quick summary of the right to know law, which I think hits the high points that we think are important to a public body. So on to the budget uh, committee and the, the, the budget process in New Hampshire. The first thing we try to always emphasize is that um, does New Hampshire have home rule? Uh, and there are some states that have home rule, um, but we're not one of them. Uh, all the power that towns and cities have come from the legislature. So generally, and, and Margaret and I spent a lot of our time speaking on the phone um, and answering questions by email. And, and a lot of the time, the first thing we do when someone calls and says, can we do X, like I, I got a call the other day, uh, there was a sophisticated question of a town near the Vermont border, which I think is where the question came from. Could we have something called an integrated zoning ordinance? Well, I didn't even know what an integrated zoning ordinance was, but I found out what it was because it's a unique kind of development zoning regulation, which only is in existence in Vermont. So what, what I have to do, I have to do the research in order to provide the answers. So that's what we spent a lot of our time. That's the first thing we do when I get a question like that. Well, is there a statute that says a town can do that? And I don't know, quickly, no, there isn't. There's one in Vermont, but there's not one in New Hampshire. So and that's a lot of, that's the first thing a lot of times we'll do. Is that a, a statutory power that can be inferred or a statutory power can be inferred from another statute that a town or city can do something? Um, and it's not enough to say that a law d doesn't say, there's no law that says we can't do it. You really have to find something that says, yes, this is a, an authority a town or a city has, or it can be inferred as inherent to a particular statutory authority. Um, now, one of the, the, the key elements of the budget process is RSA Chapter 32. Everything pretty much that is significant to how the budget committee does its job, because you have an official budget committee, your town meeting voted to have an official budget committee that incorporates certain elements of the statute. Um, but it also applies to all towns. So there are standard procedures that are set forth in RSA Chapter 32 that apply to all towns. Uh, then those in particular uh, are a set of rules that apply to towns with an official budget committee. And of course, you all know that the, the key authority that the budget committee has, it's central. And I just would share, again, I was on a budget committee for two years in my town. So I have a little bit of understanding what you go through, but real veterans of a budget committee know that <laughs> two years is, is hardly anything. In any case, um, the real key authority of the budget committee is you have a break on the ability of the town meeting to raise money. And they can't raise more than 10% above the amount recommended by the budget committee, uh, w w taking out certain things that are fi called fixed costs. And that's really key to the authority of the budget committee. Um, and I guess uh, the other thing that's key in a town 
perhaps not so much like Hampton, but in other towns that have charters. There may be a charter provision. Now, a charter is a form of home rule that is authorized by the legislature. So you have city charters and you have town charters. Uh, for instance, uh, Newmarket has a town charter. Portsmouth has a city charter. So if you had a, a charter, you also might turn to the charter provisions, help you understand how you go about your business of being a budget committee. Um, so, as I've said, um, the purpose of the budget law, in part, um, is to make sure there's a uniform method by which uh, the appropriation and spending by pu of public funds is carried out. And it, and it applies to all municipal corporations, school districts, village districts, everyone, even if they don't have a budget committee, they're subject to uh, the first, I believe it's seven or eight uh, sections of the budget law. I can't Without a budget committee? Yeah. They're the first 13? First 13 uh, sections of the budget statute, RCA Chapter 30, to apply all towns. Um, one of the things that's in the preamble that uh, it gives us other insight <coughs> of what the legislature meant, this is in RSA Chapter 32, it says the budget committee in those municipalities that have established one, like Hampton, is intended to have budgetary authority analogous to that of a legislative appropriation committee. So sometimes if you're trying to figure out, well, what's our role in terms of the relationship to the adoption of the budget process in the town meeting, that gives us some insight. That's what the legislator, legislature intended. Um, a couple of other things that are important to the general principles. The, the, the budget law also has other breaks on the action of public officials. Violators, those who spend money without an appropriation or overexpend the bottom line, mm -hmm. those people under RSA Chapter 32 can be removed from office. In fact, there's a very well known case, Blake versus the town of Pittsfield, which I'll mention. Although it doesn't directly touch on the budget law, it highlights the impact of violating the appropriation requirements of any particular department. That in that department, and this happened in the 1980s, the Pittsfield police chief uh, was told repeatedly that he was overexpending his overtime line item uh, and was eventually going to overexpend his budget as a whole. And the select board told him once, twice, three times, don't overstand your budget. And eventually he overspent it again. He had a different opinion about the necessities of public safety. Um, and he was removed from office. Now that was a removal of a police chief, and it wasn't necessarily done under the budget law, but it gives us insight. You know, if you don't follow the guidelines, and, and we'll talk about guidelines in terms of appropriation and bottom line budgeting, um, you can be removed from office. Uh, now, removal isn't automatic, although one of the interesting things about the budget law, which you may all know, um, and uh, this is in RSA Chapter 3216. If a budget committee member misses four meetings, yeah. consecutive meetings, they're out. Uh, I mean, it's automatic. And I think I don't think there's any other statute in the laws that I'm familiar with for public officials where you have an automatic removal. Yeah. But I think that's, that's what it says. Steve. What's that? For consecutive unexcused. I don't, I'm not sure if the word unexcused is in there, but uh, it's 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 for uh, uh, absences. Right. Um, the other uh, uh, limitation or break on the actions of a municipal organization that occurs, it's not just an official can be removed, but also the DRA, the Department of Revenue Administration, and they are also kind of looking over your shoulder the whole time in this process. They can disallow appropriations that do not conform to their interpretation of the budget law. And I say that advisedly because sometimes they're not necessarily correct in their interpretation of the budget law, but they can disallow appropriations. Um, again, co continuing on with general principles, there's really two basic divisions of authority in a town. You got the legislative body, which is the town meeting, and you got the governing body. So the governing body can be the select board, the village district commissioners, or the school board. Obviously, the legislative body is always the town meeting, school district meeting, or the village uh, district meeting. Two different distinct organizations. And clearly, uh, I, I think it's fair to understand that it's the legislative body that adopts the budget in the final instance. And uh, that's done by the SB2 ballot here in Hampton. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's the uh, select board who implements the budget, carries it out during the rest of the year. Um, so budget committees are not required 
It is not something that the statute mandates. That is a, a selection, a choice that a town makes. Obviously, Hampton has made a choice to have the town a, 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 an official budget committee. Um, you could also have, many towns do have this, an advisory budget committee, where uh, it's merely advisory what the budget committee uh, suggests to the, uh, the town meeting as a whole. I, and one of the things that the Supreme Court has said in a number of its opinions, the role of the budget committee is to do that kind of detailed examination of the spending and proposed spending of the town to make a rational judgment of what what kind of spending a town can actually afford from the point of view of the citizens so that you know the ordinary voter doesn't have to spend the time with those big thick budget books and i've seen them before i've carried them around to town the budget meetings myself you know with line by line of all those information you, you rely on the budget committee to do that digging and to get that information so that those recommendations come to the town meeting in terms of uh, what is eventually proposed for adoption by the town meeting. So it's a lot of meetings um, at different stages of the process. I can only tell you my experience, uh, and every town is a little bit different. You know, you've got budget committee governing body meetings, and they can be an unlimited number, um, and they're only subject to the public meeting rules, which we've discussed under 91A. Um, I, I would just uh, then you have budget hearings, and now in in a, in a SB2 town, I believe if I'm correct, it's the last the budget hearing has to occur before the second tuesday of january but don't hold me to that i'd have to go look at our calendar one of the things that we do actually do as a resource and i'll remind you of it we do and we spend a lot of time on it and it's one of our favorite jobs isn't it margaret <laughs> we spend about a month putting together these calendars that are on our website yeah. that are designed to give you the exact time frame of how you do things from a to z in a town uh, and we have one for SB2 March, April, and May. We have traditional town meeting uh, uh, March and April, and then we have uh, a uh, general, calendar. general calendar. And so they're there. So if you have a question, gee, what's the date we have to hold that budget hearing? You, know, you can go to that calendar, you can look at it. Um, and then you also have, uh, as I said, you have budget hearings you have to have, and then you have the deliberative session, which in a sense is another hearing. Uh, yeah. Because it's the, the opportunity for the voters to come out and discuss, debate, and potentially amend some of the Warren article mm -hmm. within certain rules which are set forth in RSA Chapter 40. Yeah. Um, so there are seven key concepts that really go into the budget process that we rely upon, and, and they're outlined again in our basic law of budgeting and encourage you to think about uh, even just picking up a copy. You can get it from our online bookstore. So there's appropriations. You have to have an appropriation. Uh, gross basis budgeting is another concept that we think is very important. The bottom line amount that's proposed for a particular expenditure or the bottom line amount that's proposed for the, for the budget as a whole. Warrant notice, which goes to the issue of uh, is the voter reasonably apprised of the fact that a certain item is going to be discussed and do they want to spend the time to come to town meeting, either deliberative session or voting session to vote for or against a particular situ situation, uh, such as, say, a new public safety uh, complex that there's no spending without an appropriation, lapse of appropriation, transfer of appropriation, and the 10% limitation. The last three really are key. You know, you can't spend without an appropriation. L appropriations generally lapse for the end, at the end of the fiscal year, and transfers an authority that the select board has as the governing body. So appropriation, uh, uh, concept number one, appropriation. What is an appropriation? The legislative body makes a policy decision to spend a specific amount of money for a specific purpose. Now this is usually clear to the public body when you're dealing with a special or separate Warren article, but it's the same concept when it's embedded in a line item in your budget. Yeah, and you have these forms that DRA uses. I'm, I am assuming you're all generally aware of the fact that the whole tax rate setting process has been moved into an electronic database, which is maintained by DRA. Your finance administrator is is, is feeding mm -hmm. data, and, and it from it's from that tax rate setting process. The forms and documents that are documenting how you do the process and the public hearings, that's all fed to DRA. They actually will produce for you a, a warrant uh, from a standard language that they have, and then that will be used to then with the final ruling by the town meeting to help set the tax rate. Mm -hmm. um, so an appropriation is authorization to spend money, not the actual spending itself, that we're going to raise and appropriate X dollars, uh, $100,000 to fix the fire ladder truck or to buy a new fire ladder truck, as the case may be. 
Um, uh, appropriations is to indicates to raise is to identify the source of the funds. So you're going to say, I'm going to raise and appropriate X dollars by general taxation, or I'm going to raise and appropriate 100000 from the capital reserve fund, or I'm going to spend it from a special revenue fund. Um, appropriate means I'm going to set it aside. I'm going to, as part of the Warren article, I'm going to take $100,000 out of the public works capital improvement fund to build that intersection that was decided to be improved as part of a Warren article. The purpose uh, is the goal or the aim to be accomplished through the expenditure of funds. The $100,000 is going to go towards putting in that XL and D-cell lane for that particular uh, intersection that needs to be improved. Um, and and the, the, the concepts of these appropriations is not limited to just things set forth in the DRA forms. The DRA form is the one that it, uh, Hanson's probably using is the MS-636. The MS-737 is the form that the, the, the overall budget forms that DRA uses for schools is, uh, is 737, towns is 636. Uh, but then you can also have other appropriations that would not necessarily fall into one of those categories, such as uh, it was common in my town, and we'll get to this in a second, uh, that, that our town meeting would raise an appropriate a sum every year to help support the work of the visiting nurses in the town. And so that's, you'll never see an appropriation for visiting nurses on the DRA budget form, but it certainly would be an, an appropriate public purpose. Um, and that's what we're going to speak of right now, proper public purpose. All appropriations have to be for a proper public purpose. Um, and it's any purpose not prohibited by New Hampshire Constitution or by any other law. School districts have it limited to the support of public schools and village districts purposes for which the village district is um, created. So what is a proper public purpose? Well, it doesn't necessarily have to be the same thing as public benefit. The general benefit to the public still might not count. There has to be some implied authority to appropriate it for that particular purpose. Now, generally, what we suggest is you keep in mind that um, as long as there's incidental private benefit, it doesn't necessarily mean that the proposed appropriation is illegal. So if I'm raising and appropriating $10,000 or $5,000 or even $500 to help support the work of the, cap of the uh, Visiting Nurse Association in the town of Hampton, I'm clearly going to help benefit individual clients, but it's certainly true that that's giving general public, public benefit to the town as a whole. Because what it may do, it may support people in the community and help them avoid coming to you through local welfare assistance or other forms of assistance. And they'll keep them in their homes longer, or maybe allow them to work longer. So there has to be a sufficient public benefit from a public uh, appropriation. But I think everyone would agree you're raising an appropriate money for a fire truck or to build a road. There's no doubt that's a public purpose. But certainly, you should not be spending money plowing private roads or driveways. And in fact, uh, there's a statute, and I believe it's RC 231 pulling 59, but it's close that says towns are authorized to spend money raised from taxation for class four and class five roads only. Right. And that's in cl making clear that you could have a class six road, still a town road, but you're not uh, authorized to spend public dollars on the maintenance of such a class six road. Okay. So uh, with appropriations, how specific should the Warren article be? You know, I think generally the voters should be setting uh, broad policy outlines, but leave the governing body some <laughs> flexibility as to details. If you get too specific, and we've seen this in Warren articles before, to see if the town will raise and appropriate fifty thousand dollars to buy the uh, the two thousand and ten Chevy Ford pickup truck, blue in color, which is sitting on the lot at the <laughs> Grapponi Auto Dealership, that is so specific that if it's not there, you may have a difficulty of complying with the duty to spend the money only for the approved purpose. Um, and always, as we we encourage you, you've got to, at some point in the Warren article state the the actual amount, the specific amount that's appropriated for that purpose. And, and here's an area that happens all the time, and I'll mention it here. Oftentimes, uh, we'll get a Warren article after the fact um, that the Warren article said the seat of the town will raise and appropriate $100,000 to buy a new backhoe uh, and, and to take uh, 50000 uh, and to, to, to uh, uh, take $50,000 out of the, the capital improvement fund 
uh, for that purpose and to uh, raise the rest of the money by taxation. But then uh, they decide they find another backhoe that they can spend more money on and it's a better deal, let's say. And so they think, okay, let's trade in the one we have and we'll get trade-in value. The problem is now they're about to sell a piece of town equipment, because that's what a trade-in is, and they didn't appropriate the dollars from that sale. So it's an area one has to be really careful with. If you're going to, in any transaction, uh, in a Warren article, do a trade-in or sell a piece of town equipment, say that in the article. And to raise and appropriate a sum not to exceed $20,000 from the potential sale of the existing backhoe. Um, with appropriations, there are content-based requirements that have to be for a public purpose, um, and uh, you have to have a gross amount appropriated, but there's also procedural requirements. You have to have a public hearing on your budget. Without a public hearing on the budget, you, you would probably not have a budget, or unless you, you would use a, another statute where a town meeting can uh, correct the deficiencies in um, the adoption of a budget through a second town meeting that uh, corrects procedural deficiencies. You have to disclose all purposes and amounts of appropriation at the public hearing and certainly at the deliberative session. You have to have gross-based budgeting. You have to say the total amount that's raised and appropriated for an individual article or in the budget as a whole. You have to have recommendations. There are, there are certain requirements, certainly for a budget committee, if you have a separate special warrant article, such as a bond article, or to put money, um, uh, I'm trying to think of all the, the possible ones. Uh, put money into a capital reserve put, put fund. Put money into a capital reserve fund. Warrant a article. petition warrant article. These would be special, separate warrant articles where the budget committee is required to have a recommendation on it. But you also have warrant notice that when the warrant is posted, you explain to the voters through the posting of the warrant, this is what we're proposing for the adoption of our budget. Uh, and you have to list appropriations on the posted budget, but that's in the forms, which I think nowadays, because of the way the computerized system operates, that's going to happen one way or another. Um, the budget committee has to have its first hearing at least 25 days before a traditional town meeting or on or before it's the third Tuesday in January. Mm -hmm. So this is RSA chapter colon 13. Um, so 4013 specifies the timetable for actions by uh, budget committee in SB2 town. It has to be held by the official budget committee and has to be at least seven days notice before that public hearing uh, for it to be a valid public hearing. All purposes of appropriation must be discussed or disclosed at the public hearing. So if the budget committee receives a last minute request from the select board at the public hearing, as long as it's discussed and disclosed at that public hearing, that can be a legal appropriation. Um, uh, budget committee and the governing body cannot take, can take the suggestions or they can say, no, we're not going to take up that proposal. But you can get new purposes and additional amounts may be brought, at, brought up at the public hearing. After the close of the public hearing, no new purpose or amount can be added by the budget committee or the governing body without another hearing. Now, that theoretically could occur if you had enough time before your deliberative session to squeeze in another public hearing, and I've seen towns do it. Uh, at the last second, if you have enough time before your deliberative session, depending upon when your deliberative session is scheduled, because you've got that floating date, first Saturday in January, second, whatever it is, uh, you might be able to squeeze in the time for the seven-day notice for a public, a public hearing. You can't have any increased amounts or no two subject, new subject matter, so important to emphasize. Once the public hearing is closed and you're not holding another public hearing, you can't add increased amounts to the budget and you can't add new subject matter. It's fixed, set. Um, appropriations um, that you have uh, uh, for the budget also apply to petition warrant article. That is, public hearings apply to petition warrant article. So if there's a petition warrant article to raise an appropriate public dollars, that has to have a public hearing. Um, you can have at least one hearing after the petition deadline. Schedule at least one hearing after the petition article deadline. So there's a petition article deadline in the statute, which I believe is in an SB2 town. It's the first mm -hmm. or second Monday in January. And so it's probably a good idea, and again, you can look at our calendars to try to schedule your public hearing, not necessarily in the last day, but at least uh, with enough time so that you know that all the possible petition warrant articles have been received, that you hold it after the deadline for the petition warrant article period has gone by. Um, 
And the, the budget committee uh, holds, finalizes the budget after the close of the public <coughs> hearing and at the public meeting. Um, in SB2 towns, uh, in uh, such, such as Hampton, if you received, if the town received a petition for an article that raises money by bonds and indebtedness of more than $100,000, mm -hmm. there's a different deadline for the petition to be submitted. And that requires that it be submitted no later than the Friday before the second Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Again, you're probably going to find it easier if you have a concern about meeting your deadlines. Just check our calendars. We're going to be spending a lot of long hours in July getting those ready, and we'll produce them and get them available on our website and mailed to you during September. Um, the ultimate uh, hearing deadline for a budget is 14 days before the town meeting. However, um, for a, a town like uh, Hampton, there's a set time period for having the budget posted. So what in my town, when I did my budget, we actually had the school district moderator, excuse me, the superintendent would walk up to us when we concluded the school budget hearing and he would ask us to sign the budget for him. He wanted it signed because he was going to post it the day or two later. Same thing we'd do with the, at the select board. They would walk up, the finance director would walk up and say, like, put your signature on the budget for him. Uh, but in SB2 town, like Hampton, you have to post the budget on or before the last Monday in January. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the, you know, the time frame. You've got to get things done and ready to be presented to the voters at the deliberative session. For appropriations and the posting of the warrant, it's traditionally 14 days before the meeting. It has to include all appropriations. If you don't have the appropriations listed in your budget or on a separate warrant article, uh, the DRA will invalidate any appropriations that are not appropriately listed. Again, this is where DRA will intervene and say, wait a minute, you missed a step. You didn't have a proper notice of that proposed appropriation which you think you have now have adopted. A um, couple of things and examples that I think are worthy of note for, on the subject of gross-based budgeting. Uh, so the first one is a warrant article. See if the town will vote to raise an appropriate $25,000 to replace the wooden play structure at the town playground. The total replacement cost is $35,000, but $5,000 will be withdrawn from the Playground Capital Reserve Fund, and the selectmen have received a commitment for a donation for the remaining $5,000. So the, the immediate problem is mm -hmm. it did not say to raise an appropriate $35,000. Right. That's the gross amount. Certainly you could have the um, dollars coming from the Cape Playground Capital Reserve Fund, and you could even say, and to include any uh, donation not to exceed $5,000. Um, so as we suggest, you could change it to say to raise an appropriate $35,000 for the play structure. Of this, $5,000 is authorized to be withdrawn from the Capital Reserve Fund, $5,000 is anticipated from private donation, and $25,000 is raised by taxation. You have all the actual funds the dollars are coming from, and you have the total appropriation. That's what we mean by gross-based budgeting. Um, another example, to see if the town will vote to raise an appropriate <coughs> amount necessary to buy the 2015 Ford F3350 4x4 dump truck, and I have no idea what that is, Expensive <laughs> Ford sales in, in Fordham, New Hampshire. Um, and so the biggest problem is the failure to appropriate a sum certain um, because we don't know what they need for the appropriation. But also, it's a very specific designated exact model, which if that model is not there and available, you're not going to be able to make this appropriation. So clearly the solution is to have a gross appropriation and really don't use this very specific limitate, limiting language that limits the, the select board to a particular item. <laughs> Uh, a couple other examples to see if the town would vote to create the position of athletic director to coordinate the activities of youth athletic leagues. This is a part-time voluntary position. Uh, and then there's an amendment at the town meeting to uh, raise an appropriate $20,000 for the salary. So the immediate problem is the war original Warren article didn't have an appropriation, so it wasn't the subject of a public hearing, and there was no notice of that proposed appropriation. So adding the $20,000 at the floor of the deliberative session is problematic. It'll probably be disallowed. The original article was probably fine um, if it was going to be a voluntary position, but if you add in the salary, it's going to be problematic, and it would, would make it difficult. They could have just left it alone and uh, allow the select board to try to encourage someone out in the world who's willing to spend their time doing it. Um, if they wanted to fund the position, uh, they could have perhaps amend the operating budget 
to add $20,000 to the bottom line, but that doesn't mean the select board is required to spend those dollars. It would just be kind of moral suasion to encourage the select board to uh, have this person whose voluntary uh, proposal could be turned into a paying position. Um, so I think I am at, no, I continue. You have a lot more to go, Steve. Okay. <laughs> so gross-based budgeting, we've already talked about special warrant articles. We've got special warrant articles which are petitioned appropriations, bond issues, coming dollars in or out of capital reserve funds or trust funds, designated special or non-lapsing or non-transferable. All of these kinds of warrant articles are ones where the budget committee does have to give a recommendation, yes or no. Uh, and in some towns, you've actually perhaps voted to indicate how the vote went. You know, mm -hmm. vote of six in favor, four opposed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, uh, recommendations are optional, as I mentioned, for a numeric tally. You can be required to have a numeric tally. It, again, it, it is uh, for se special and separate warrant articles. And as indicated, typically you'll have the budget committee saying they're going to recommend the article for a vote of 9 to 2, or the yeah. select board does not recommend the article by 3 to 2. Um, already mentioned that the official budget committee is an, uh, an action taken by the town meeting under RSA 3214. Uh, advisory committees are allowed, uh, <coughs> but since you don't have an advisory committee, you probably don't need to spend a lot of time on that issue. Now, the duties of the budget committee are review the current year's expenditures, review, review proposals of the governing body in terms of expenditures, prepare the budget, schedule and hold the budget hearings, and forward the final proposed budget to the governing body for posting at the warrant. Mm -hmm. It's the budget committee's budget. Yes. In terms of budget preparation, it is also the, the law that all municipal officers, administrative officials, uh, department heads, uh, prepare statements of estimated expenditures, and uh, they also statement of revenues for the ensuing year. Uh, that is part of what all the officials should be doing. And these have to be submitted in such times and such details the governing body may require. In my town, the way it worked, and everyone's a little bit different, um, the, the town manager, we have a town manager for government just like uh, Hampton has, the town manager would have the department heads assemble his, their budgets and they would submit them to the town manager. The town manager would take a pass at them, usually cut them back by 5 to 10 percent, <laughs> and he would eventually present it to the select board. The select board would then cut it back another 5 to 10 percent and eventually would be handed to us. Um, in that process, what we developed, I don't know how you do it here, but we developed a process in, where I live in the town of Bow that the town select board, before they would hand the budget to us, they would have two day-long hearings with all the departments. Each department head would come into the select board and say, here's our pitch for our budget. And really it allowed the department heads to say, yes, we know what the town manager has proposed, but this is what we really want. Mm -hmm. And then the select board can either go along with the town manager or listen to the department heads and say, yes, we're going to modify our proposal. Um, and so that's just one way that you can get the information perhaps you want to have in terms of making your judgments about appropriate amounts for uh, that particular department. Um, now, there is uh, department heads and other officers uh, have also have an obligation to, to mit, submit their departmental statements uh, and expenditures and receipts to the budget committee if requested. That's RSA Chapter 32, 16. Um, so there is a mechanism where the budget committee can ask for this information. But I think you, you're, you probably have a little bit different situation uh, when you're dealing with a, a town that has a town manager form of government. Because when you have a town manager form of government, um, rather than the select board sitting on top of all these departments, and it's a little bit unwieldy for the departments to decide how they submit their information to the select board, and especially if there's a budget committee asking for information, you might be getting the departments asking for information to be submitted directly to the budget committee or to the, or to the select board. However, when you have a town manager, clearly under RSA 37, the town manager is the, the chief of all the departments. So in terms of this process where the budget committee has a need for information for a particular department, I think it's probably wise with a town manager form of government respect the hierarchy because all the people who work under the town manager are hired and fired by the town manager. So they have some degree of responsibility to file, to follow the, the, uh, the lines of authority. They, the information flows up to the department heads, goes to the town manager, and then uh, that would be something which could be 
as I've suggested here, a conduit transmitting information to the Budget Committee. Now, certainly it's true that um, a Budget Committee might be involved in evaluating the expenditure side of a town's budget. So currently, right now, that's the process you typically would be in, because you don't really get into the process of building a budget until after it's put together by the town manager and the select board proposes it to you. In my town, typically that would happen sometime in October, November, and then we'd start budget hearings in December and complete them by the end of January, certainly for an SB2 town. Um, so. In terms of now, you've got this period of time from you know May until probably September when the budget process really gets started. Certainly, it makes sense for a budget committee to be looking at well, what's what's the expenditure side of the operations? What's going on? And you may have a need to collect information. But I think in terms of your situation with a town manager, it should probably be go through the conduit of the town manager. You have a budget information request. I think that should always come from the budget committee as a whole, not individuals who have a particular interest in something. It should flow through to the town manager and come back to the budget committee. So you can monitor what you think is going on in terms of the expenditure side. So um, I think at this stage, Warren we need a break. <laughs> will take over and deal with budget transfer information. Yeah. So, so now we're moving on to the sort of expenditure side. And as I'm sure you know, the selectmen, they are the body in town that has the ability to expend funds. So the budget committee proposes a budget. The legislative body ultimately adopts the budget as amended, if, if at all, by the legislative body. And then the expenditure authority rests with the select board. And what 32 section 10 says, and that's the statute that's cited there for you on your slide, is that the governing body may transfer to an appropriation an unexpended balance remaining in some other appropriation. So the idea here is that you have a bottom line budget. Yes, it was made up of a lot of different line items for different reasons with different amounts. But at the end of the day, you added it all up to one big bottom line figure. And that is what the legislative body adopted, a bottom line budget. And so the selectmen, as the <coughs> entity, as the body in town that holds the purse strings, they have the ability to spend that money within that budget, which includes transferring some money from one purpose to another. We appropriated X for this uh, department, but we actually don't need that much. We need some of that over in Y department, and they have the ability to transfer those funds to meet the needs of the town as the year goes on. Because we budget, but then different you know, changes can lead to expenditures for slightly different purposes. Really important, and this is incumbent upon the governing body, the selectmen, is that they keep records of their transfers. <laughs> Both the public and the budget committee needs to be able to see what transfers are going on and why. Because this goes back to what Steve was saying about monitoring expenditures throughout the year. If you are the entity in town that has the role of putting together a proposed budget, you know your job is to educate the voters and, and put out a budget that represents the needs of the municipality. So if the budgeting is so off balance that there's constantly a need to transfer from one place to another, that informs you in your putting together of the budget for the next year based on how the expenditures have gone throughout the previous fiscal year. Of course, nobody has the ability to dispute the selectman's authority to transfer. So even if you are looking at the records and seeing what the transfer is and, and you're considering that as you put together the next year's budget, the budget committee is not an expenditure body and they don't have the ability to stop the transfer of money and neither does the legislative body. They can't vote um, to you know, restrict transfer authority among line items in the operating budget. Um, the limits on appropriations, Steve has already mentioned the 10% rule. So, of course, any um, municipality with an official budget committee like Hampton has that ceiling. The legislative body has a ceiling on it. So they can't, as they're making amendments to the budget, they can't um, ultimately adopt more than 10% more of the total recommended budget of the budget committee. And what you see here in the second bullet is that the 10%, for the purposes of the 10%, you add up everything. So that's the operating budget and all of those separate warrant articles that contain money appropriations. But there are a few things that get taken out of that calculation. 
fixed charges, bonds, interest and principal on payments, notes except tax anticipation notes, interest and principal payments on them, mandatory assessment imposed um, by towns on towns. So there are a few things that don't get calculated in, but typically what you're looking at is the whole picture mm -hmm. and not just the adopted operating budget for the purposes of the 10% rule. Um, the ballot or or on the on the warrant, which is of course what you have before your deliberative mm -hmm. session, the selectmen have the duty to put the warrant together and put it out to the voters within the time frame, and that warns the voters, this is what we're acting on, this is what we're discussing and deliberate, deliberating at the deliberative session. Um, that's their role to put together um, the warrant, and then of course um, the ballot is put together after the deliberative session because it has to reflect any amendments made to warrant articles that were contained on the warrant. The ballot needs to contain, and same thing with the warrant, needs to contain just what the law says it's supposed to. So that's the, the questions that are being put to the legislative body, any recommendations required by law, um, any estimated tax impact, which you'll see up here on the screen, but nothing else. So the warrant, the ballot, that is not a place for explanatory information about why certain appropriations are being proposed, certainly not a place for any kind of advocacy language or things of that nature. Voter guides can accomplish uh, educating voters about why certain expenditures are being um, proposed, but that's not for the warrant and it's not for the ballot. Um, the estimated tax impact, something that the legislative body adopts and says, yes, we want. Um, we want that to be on our warrant articles. It's put on the operating budget and any special articles with a tax impact as determined by the selectmen. And then ultimately the tax impact is subject to their approval. So, so they're the ones who approve that yes, this is um, the appropriate tax impact. Warrant notice. So Steve mentioned at the beginning that the way we like to break out our budgeting concepts is into the seven key concepts. So we would now be on number three if you were looking in our basic law of budgeting book. This would be concept number three. And I think Steve has already touched upon a lot of this, but the idea here is that an appropriation is only valid if the subject matter appears in the warrant. You are warning voters. This is what we are acting upon. So it has to be in the warrant that is required by 32 section six and new purposes or new line items cannot be added from the floor of the meeting because they were not warned. Doesn't prevent amendments to warrant articles that are on the warrant, but it prevents new things that were not warned on the warrant prior to the deliberative session. Um, notice and amendments. You are an SB2 municipality, so you have heard perhaps that um, there are restrictions on the extent to which the legislative body can amend warrant articles. Um, we're going to get to that in a second, but let's just sort of the basic points here is that um, at the deliberative session, the voters can amend warrant articles from the floor. So in SB2, you're not ultimately voting to adopt articles, but you are discussing mm -hmm. and you are amending and you are finalizing the language for the ballot. That is the purpose of the deliberative session. You have, you know, voters have the ability, of course, they're going to discuss and deliberate the separate warrant articles. Each one is going to be taken up for discussion. Um, when it comes to the operating budget, of course, that shows up on the warrant as an article that reflects the bottom line budget. But of course, posted is also the DRA budget form, which breaks out that bottom line budget further into the DRA line item appropriation purposes. So voters do have the ability to take the budget so-called line by line. Um, this is perhaps effective if obviously if this is what the voters want to do if they're the legislative body they control um, to a certain extent their deliberative session but keep in mind that even if the voters took the budget line by line they wanted to vote on each line item in the DRA budget an amendment to a single line item say they wanted to decrease one line item by twenty thousand dollars I think that you all know that that would actually be an amendment to the bottom line budget right. and it wouldn't be an amendment to that particular line item. You would still have a bottom line figure. It would now be decreased by $20,000. The selectmen retain the authority to transfer between line items in the budget anyway, so they could try to make up the difference in the cut in the bottom line budget. 
As you know, you're the budget committee. It's your proposed budget that goes to the voters, but it is just that. It's a proposed budget, and they're the ones who adopt it and potentially make amendments to it um, before it goes on the ballot and before it is ultimately voted on, um, subject, of course, to the 10% rule. So notice and um, amendments, sort of a few more words on this. Um, one of the things that can happen with amendments is that you can, that the voters can make changes that may sort of run afoul of the requirement for mm -hmm. warrant notice. So, you know, doing things like altering the mode of funding. So let's say you have uh, the Ford uh, F-350 truck and the way that it's set out in um, the warrant article um, is certain funding sources, but the voters want to make an amendment to change the funding sources slightly. That's usually okay. Okay, but keep in mind that if it changes it significantly, you could have a failure to change because the warrant article subject matter has been changed so significantly. So an appropriation to a capital reserve fund um, would be something that would need to be warned and couldn't come out as an amendment on the floor of the deliberative session for the first time. Another example might be an amendment to add a agents to expend to a capital reserve fund. So let's say there's an article on the warrant to establish a capital reserve fund, but the way that the article appeared on the warrant, it did not say anything about agents to expend. If the voters tried to add agents to expend to the article on the floor of the deliberative session, that would be invalid because it wasn't warned. And that really is a very substantial change because when you have a capital reserve fund that has agents to expend, then those agents, typically the selectmen, have the ability to spend from that capital reserve fund without going back to the voters for legislative approval. On the other hand, if there are no agents to expend, expenditures from the CRF would have to be done by a legislative body vote. So that is an extremely substantial change to the warrant article. We normally talk about the notice requirements as the so-called stay-at-home test. So you need to warn people sufficiently of the subject matter. So if they were interested in that subject matter, the warrant would let them know that they should come out and hear it and deliberate and discuss it. But you know, you, the idea is that if it's changed so substantially that someone would have come out if it had been warned, if it had been included on the warrant, that you are in violation of the stay at home rule. So that's sort of the colloquial way of saying that you need to give warrant notice. So in traditional town meetings, you know, or you may know, especially um, if you remember uh, traditional town meeting days, that voters can do a lot of different things at the town meeting. And one of those things is that they can table or pass over warrant articles entirely. So we don't like this article. We don't want to act on it. We don't want to vote yes or no. Either way, we're going to table it. No action other than that is going to be taken. You know that as an SB2 municipality, Every article on the warrant is going on to the ballot. All you're doing at the deliberative session is finalizing the language that's going to show up on the ballot. So you can't pass over or table articles at the deliberative session. The voters can't move to strike them so that they don't show up on the ballot. And voters also can't, and voters have tried this, and there was a Supreme Court case uh, ruling that you can't do this. Voters have tried, well, okay, we can't pass over it, we can't delete it. What if we just take all the words after the words to see, um, delete them, and then all that shows up on the ballot are the words to see. No, that is in effect deleting or passing over um, a warrant article that has to show up on the ballot. Um, with regard to the requirement that voters can amend but can't eliminate the subject matter, that's the standard. So when we talk about, well, what's the big difference between traditional and, um, and, and SB2, what you see in RSA 40 section 13 is that the voters can't eliminate the subject matter of the article although they can freely amend dollar amounts just like in a traditional town meeting. Just by way of sort of an example, there was a superior court case this year, this year, in, in 2016, I believe, where the voters in an SB2 municipality had amended this Warren article. The article, I believe, was a petitioned article, and the article's content, its original content, was to take the police chief and the welfare officer positions to make them elected and then to give them a set salary. That was the way the petitioned article looked when it went on the warrant. 
at the SB2 deliberative session, the voters substantially amended it. They amended it to say that this is an advisory article that the voters would like to continue to have these positions be appointed. And any reference to the annual salaries of these officials was struck out of the article entirely. A voter who was displeased with this result brought a lawsuit against the town. And the court said that this kind of amendment was okay. Mm -hmm. The original intent of the warrant article was preserved. It was about the police chief and the welfare officer and their positions in the municipality and the status of their positions. And even though there was a substantial change, it was still okay. The amendment was still valid. So that kind of gives you an idea that yes, there are restrictions, but for at least for the purposes of eliminating the subject matter, as long as the basic intent is preserved by the amendment, mm -hmm. the amendment is probably okay. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you have heard no means no. I'm sure you have heard no spending without an appropriation. That is key concept number four. Again, as Steve said, an appropriation is a legislative body action. They appropriate money. They say, yes, we're going to set this money aside to spend for a particular purpose. And the idea here is that you can't spend or the, the, the governing body can't spend unless that amount was appropriated for that purpose. So I think that's a pretty basic concept, but I don't think it can ever be said enough that if you don't have a proper appropriation, you're not going to be able to spend for that purpose. And proper appropriation, that goes back in time to what Steve was talking about, starting with the procedural requirements, with the notice, with the discuss or disclose at a budget hearing. All of that is part of having a procedurally proper appropriation. There are exceptions, of course, as there are exceptions to every rule, the no means no rule has exceptions. Of course, transfer authority still exists um, in the governing body under 32 section 10, although they can't transfer to a purpose that doesn't exist or that has been deleted properly um, or you know zeroed out, which is the equivalent of deleted just going to say for a moment that when we're thinking about transfer authority and again I've already said that you know the voters and the budget committee can't restrict the selectmen's transfer authority um, a zeroed out purpose that would prohibit transfer we are talking about a zeroed out or deleted purpose on the posted DRA budget form so the legislative body would have to zero out, for example, police on the municipal budget form in order to say that this is a purpose for which no money can be spent. Sometimes there's confusion. Sometimes voters think there's an ability to sort of go into the weeds and delete purposes that are represented on the so-called municipal chart of accounts, which is normally a very detailed form that each municipality has in order to help track expenditures and in order to properly calculate the budget that goes on to the municipal budget form. But we're talking about what I like to call the big line items, which are the line items that show up on the DRA form. <clears throat> Other exceptions, legal judgments. If there's a legal judgment, again, against the town, the town can't say we didn't appropriate money, we can't pay that legal judgment, they have to pay it. Um, there is, DR, you can get DRA permission to overspend the bottom line or add an appropriation, but that's with DRA permission. Um, and there are other sort of prior mandates that you can't get out of, uh, federal or state requirements, the classic example being welfare, um, which a town is required to provide even if the welfare budget has run out. So that is a requirement. Other exceptions, you are a March town meeting mm -hmm. in towns um, with the March town meeting in the January to December fiscal year. Obviously, there is a gap in time between the beginning of the year and the town meeting at which appropriations are made. And what the statute says, and this is 32 section 13 paragraph 2, is that the governing body can spend for that time period prior to the town meeting making its appropriations they can spend because obviously they have to be able to and those expenditures would be have to be reasonable in light of the prior year's approved appropriations and purposes so you're trying to mimic last year's sort of for that status quo period prior to the town meeting in March where the appropriations are made even more exceptions 
Unanticipated revenue under RSA 31, Section 95-B. If the legislative body has given approval under this statute to the governing body to accept unanticipated revenue, the governing body has the ability to do that. There are some requirements, such as for unanticipated revenue of $10,000 or more, there has to be um, a public hearing, and acceptance of unanticipated revenue can't require the expenditure of additional funds unless those additional funds were appropriated um, as a way of accepting the grant. Capital reserve and trust funds with agents to expend. So trust funds where the legislative body has said, yes, selectmen, you are the agents to expend. You can expend from that trust fund during the year without further legislative approval. They can spend for that purpose, consistent with why the fund was created. Other funds, like the Conservation Fund, Heritage Fund, um, Revolving Funds, Water and Sewer Revolving Funds, those are funds that have particular entities that have the ability to spend money from those funds consistent with the purpose for which the fund exists. Um, so if there is a situation where um, they're the sort of the selectmen are out of money for a particular purpose, of course they have transfer authority. So they're looking in the budget to find places where they can transfer money to the purpose that they need it for. Um, we've already talked about anticip unanticipated funds and the acceptance authority, DRA permission to overspend, and then sort of as a, a very sort of last result, I think special meetings. Because keep in mind that a special meeting where money is going to be appropriated, you have to have prior court approval, all right? So it's a big deal in order to have a special meeting. Just a couple words here on multi-year agreements. There are sort of different types of multi-year agreements. Collective bargaining is sort of the classic example. You have costs over a period of years based on a contract that's been agreed to. And even though the contract may have been agreed to, the cost items are still subject to legislative body approval because the legislative body appropriates money. Mm -hmm. um, the way that it works with collective bargaining agreements is that the cost items, the expense that is associated with this multi-year collective bargaining agreement goes to the voters for approval. All right, and so the voters appropriate it, the voters say yes, and what, what happens is the total cost items for the life of the collective bargaining agreement have to be disclosed up front to the voters during that, this, during that fiscal year at that town meeting. And if the voters have that disclosure and they say yes, and they say yes to that article and they adopt those cost items, they, that is a way that one town meeting sort of binds into the future. It's a way of binding to a multi-year contract and it is authorized. And in fact, it goes beyond collective bargaining agreements because it can happen with other multi-year agreements that the governing body wants to enter into. And they can do that, but it's the same idea that the full cost of that multi-year contract must be adequately disclosed to the legislative body <coughs> and adopted by the legislative body in order for the legislative body to bind going forward. Because mm -hmm. remember, the idea is that appropriations lapse at the end of the year. So if you want the legislative body to approve multiple years of appropriations for a contract, they're going to have to have those cost items for the whole life of the contract disclosed and say yes to those cost items for the full life of the contract. Multi-year equipment leases, there are some special year, uh, rules with multi-year equipment leases. Obviously, equipment leases are an important part of any municipality. If there is a so-called escape clause in the multi-year lease agreement, that it's a simple majority because the voters are actually adopting the amount for each year of the multi-year lease at each town meeting. So they do it each year, and the escape clause allows the governing body to get out of the contract if the voters don't appropriate it in any given year. So if it's a five-year lease and the voters, and it has an escape clause, and the voters say yes the first three years, and they say no the fourth year, um, there's no appropriation, they can't spend for that purpose, the governing body can use the escape clause to get out of the multi-year lease. If there's no escape clause, which means they can't get out of it, um, then it's considered, um, um, long-term debt under 33 section 7e and there are some different rules for it and this term Sanborn eyes that you see that we have up on the slide here that comes from a case um, this out of Sanborn 
Sanborn um, School District. Sanborn yeah. School District, and sort of that's where the term came from, yeah. was how, do, how are collective bargaining agreements properly adopted, and we now say that we have to Sanbornize them, which simply means adequately disclose the cost items mm -hmm. for the life of the contract. And it applies to all multi-year contracts, not just collective bargaining agreements. Key concept number five, which I just referenced, is the idea that appropriations lapse at the end of the fiscal year. They are good for the year, mm -hmm. and then they lapse. The unspent money, if any, goes into the fund balance. It is not free money to do anything with. It's not leftover money to go shopping with. It has to be appropriated again by the voters. That's one thing that can happen to it. It's, it's in there, and it can be appropriated for expenditures at the next town meeting. It can be used to reduce the following year's tax rate, mm -hmm. um, or it can be retained for emergencies. Um, and sometimes retaining um, a certain amount of the fund balance is a good idea. And in fact, as you'll see on the next slide, the recommendation is 5 to 15 yeah. percent of regular general fund operating revenues, or 8 to 17 percent of regular general fund operating expenditures is a safe percentage to retain in the general fund. The fund balance, and this is just to give you a general idea, and often Barbara speaks to this because she's so good at all of this <laughs> stuff, but the fund balance is the net amount of the unexpended appropriations, excess revenues received, uncollected taxes, and other liabilities. That is what you are thinking about when someone uses the term fund balance. That is what it is. There are, again, exceptions to the lapse rule. So the general rule is appropriations lapse at the end of the year. But that's not the end of the sentence. One of, Steve mentioned special versus um, separate warrant articles. One really important exception to the lapse rule are special warrant articles. And there are sort of two ways that special warrant articles don't have to lapse necessarily at the end of the fiscal year. Any special warrant article, so these are bonds, these are petitioned articles, um, these are articles funding capital reserve funds, and these are any other articles designated simply as special, non-lapsing, um, right. things of that nature. Any special warrant article can be encumbered for one additional year by the governing body prior to the end of the fiscal year. Yeah. They have a special warrant article adopted in, in March of 2016. Prior to the end of tw 2016 fiscal year, the governing body can encumber one more year. Yeah. Another way that special warrant articles get encumbered mm -hmm. is if the special warrant article itself, when adopted, said this is a special warrant article, it's non-lapsing, and it's not going to lapse for X amount of years. Mm -hmm. That amount of years can be up to five. That's yeah. the maximum. So you could have language in the initial warrant article that said it's non-lapsing for up to three years, four years, five years, and that would be another way to prevent lapse. Um, another way to, um, to prevent lapse is encumbering funds by contract, so entering into a truly enforceable contract before the end of the fiscal year to encumber funds to be spent for the purpose of that contract mm -hmm. is another way. Bonds are do not lapse anticipated grants. Grants last for the lifetime of whatever the grant says the money is available for. Capital reserve funds, again, you're saving up money. Those continue on and on throughout the years. Same thing with trust funds, special revenue funds, and revolving funds, which we'll hopefully have time to speak on a little bit, Or, I, but I do see that I have approximately 11 minutes. Um, <laughs> laps, more on the lapse of appropriation, other non-lapsing funds. These are other types of funds that the money doesn't lapse at the end of the year, and the language you usually see on the statute is that the funds accrue from year to year, which means do not lapse. Conservation funds, sewer, water, impact fees collected, and also recreation revolving funds under 35B. And the other thing you also will commonly see with regards to some of these funds is it also is made clear these funds, such as the water fund, the sewer fund, it's not part of the general fund of the town. They're always considered separate funds and designated as such in the statute that creates them. Absolutely. Um, we've already talked quite a bit about transfer of appropriations. The only thing that I don't think we've talked about is that transfer cannot be out of special warrant articles. So there are sort of two special things about special warrant articles. One is the avoidance of lapse for a period of time, and the other is that the selectman can't transfer money out of a special warrant article to be spent on another purpose. But we've really already gone over most of these concepts. 
this case that's referenced up here, <laughs> Sullivan versus, uh, and I know versus that one. Hampton. <laughs> um, it affirms the governing body's unfettered authority to transfer, and it applies to both the operating budget or the default budget. Sometimes we do get questions uh, with yeah. confusion about transfer in the default <laughs> budget. Default budget is still the op an operating budget. It's just that the one proposed didn't pass, so we have the default budget. But all of the authority with regard to transfer remains even in a default budget year. <laughs> Um, just a word, and I, I think I've talked a little bit about no means no and deleting of purposes. The no means no rule really uh, was meant to apply to separate articles. So you have an article set out separately from the operating budget mm -hmm. to appropriate money for a particular purpose, and the voters say, no thanks. They don't adopt it. No means no really means no spending for the purpose right. stated in that separate article that the voters said no to. That's the way it works. And that can be, you know, sort of a, a consideration when putting appropriations into separate articles is that, yes, it's great if the voters adopt it, but it's it cannot be so great if the voters say no because it restricts the ability to spend from the operating budget from that purpose, you know? So it's a big restriction and it's, a, it's an important restriction. <coughs> And as I've already said, when we're talking about deleting or zeroing out purposes, aside from separate articles, which are much sort of clearer to conceptualize when those have been zeroed out or those have been deleted um, or not adopted, also separate line items in the DRA budget could technically be zeroed out or deleted, but it would truly have to be the big line items in um, the operating budget, which would be a horrible thing to have happen. This is, we just use sort of this figure or this picture here to, to give you an idea of the budget cycle. Obviously, it's, it's, a, it's sort of a constant cycle because, you know, there's preparation of the budget in the fall, that sort of that around that time frame. There's adoption of the budget in March. And then there's just sort of, uh, you know, monitoring of expenditures and getting ready to, again, propose another budget in the fall. Um, and so being aware of the expenditures that are going on and being aware of how the budget is working out is part of the budget committee's role as well. Um, and so this just gives you an idea that that is sort of how the cycle, cycle of life in the budget world works. I only have a few more minutes here, so I'm going to go over um, just a couple fun sources, and I won't go into depth on municipal bonds. There's <coughs> several slides on municipal bonds, and I don't think that we need to go super in depth on those, probably not your most pressing issue. But just to keep in mind, there are a lot of other fund sources um, other than general taxation other ways um, to fund appropriations, reserve funds, saving, which are savings accounts, um, entering into lease agreements, bonds or notes. User fees is another way to, um, to get income for, to use for appropriations, special revenue or revolving funds, grants, unanticipated revenue, state aid if that exists, general fund balance, and property taxes. Really important, I think, just to touch upon reserve funds and the fact that the so, sort of so-called trust fund, which you can you might hear municipal trust fund or town funded trust fund, and then you'll also hear people use use the term capital <coughs> reserve fund. They're really the same concept. You know, they're both savings for expenditure on a particular purpose. They're funds that don't lapse. Both of them can have agents to expend or not which means that if there's going to be an expenditure from the fund, the town meeting, the legislative body has to appropriate money. But an expendable trust fund is technically governed by 31, section 19A, um, some kind of fund established for a specific public purpose, so any proper public purpose that an appropriation can be made for, although we're usually thinking maintenance and operations type activities, Capital reserve funds, same concept, except they are limited to the specific public purpose listed in 35 section one, and you're talking about capital items, improvement, acquisition, equipment, land, things of that nature, all right? But they both play by the same rules, um, expendable trust funds and capital reserve funds. There are specific rules for establishing the funds. There are specific rules if you want to change the purpose of a fund, one of those rules being it would require 
require a two-thirds vote for a legislative body to change purpose from A to B of an already existing capital reserve fund and then dissolving funds. There's no ability to transfer money among capital reserve funds or trust funds. You can't just tra appropriate from one fund into another, um, but you can change the purpose. You can discontinue capital reserve funds and appropriate money from a discontinued <coughs> capital reserve fund to a new purpose or into a new capital reserve fund. Expendable trust funds can be used to mitigate operating costs, and that's sort of the idea here. Um, one of the examples that Steve gives often is the health insurance increase, having um, an expendable trust fund that sort of has money for, for sort of taking care of situations where there are health insurance increase or pension costs and sort of having that money available to offset operating budget costs by having that ETF. Lease agreements. I think I've already talked about this. Um, but lease agreements with a non-appropriation clause, the escape clause, um, they can be uh, terminated annually in the event that there's no appropriation. They're not debt. They require a majority vote. Sort of the key here on this slide is that a capital reserve fund cannot be used to fund a lease agreement that has an escape clause except for the final payment. That is what the statute says. Lease agreements without an escape clause, they do constitute long-term debt. They need, um, and they have to be adopted using that supermajority vote requirement that you find in RSA Chapter 33. And capital reserve fund money can be used for multiple payments on a lease agreement without an escape clause. Again, those are listed right in the statute, and um, those are sort of important for um, you know the selectmen, but also you to keep in mind, because when you're budgeting, you need to know what the capital reserve fund can be used for and what it can't be. So I'm just going to skip through municipal bonds here because I want to just touch briefly here on user fees um, and then special revenue versus revolving funds and then we will end for um, this presentation. So user fees are obviously an excellent way of generating money for a particular purpose. Um, you know, they can be for a specific service, they benefit a specific segment of the population or for a public service, they benefit the general public. Um, you know, everyone benefits, no one can opt out. So when you have user fees for things that only certain people use, they're the ones paying the user fee. If it applies to everyone equally, then there's no way to sort of avoid the, uh, the user fee. And I think what we have here is just um, a somewhat ill-conceived image here of the spectrum of, um, you know, the water sewer kind of user fee being a specific one um, for those people using the water sewer. And then police fire is something that everyone is responsible for and applies equally to everyone. In deciding whether you have the ability to charge a user fee for something, it sort of just goes back to the concept of no home rule, and we need to look for authority to act in this area before we can either appropriate or have a user fee for it. Um, is there statutory authority for the fee? Well, we have, and, and I spent more time than I care to share with you, putting together a chart in the basic law of budgeting, I believe of all or most of the statutes that authorize user fees, um, permit fees, license charges, mm -hmm. things of that nature. So we have a chart in one of the appendices here, and it's a great starting point for going in and saying, is there an ability to charge a fee for this particular purpose? And there were way more than I even realized there would be once I was done with the <laughs> appendix. Um, you know, making a determination of what's the appropriate level um, of cost for the fee, um, the cost for the service is obviously something that has to be taken into consideration. And then there's also the, the, the thought of where the money's going to go, because one, these are sort of the two classic places that you put um, fees, being the special revenue fund or a revolving fund. Mm -hmm. Really important to just know the basic difference between the two. You know, the, the money goes into both of them, but a special revenue fund, the legislative body votes to restrict revenue or a portion of revenue from a specific purpose mm -hmm. to expenditures for a specific purpose. So mm -hmm. that sounds like revolving fund, but it's really important that it, you need an appropriation from the legislative body every time you want to spend from a special revenue fund. <coughs> On the other hand, when the legislative body creates a revolving fund, it again is limited to a particular activity, but 
what happens is the money from the activity goes into the fund, and then the money from the fund comes out of the fund to pay for the activity. Yeah. And that is why it's called a revolving fund. It's supposed to be a self-sustaining fund, getting fees from an activity, spending fees for an activity. Mm -hmm. And in that situation, there's no legislative body uh, approval needed once the revolving fund is established. The money goes in, the money comes out in order to fund that particular purpose. I've already talked about all of these requirements up here on the screen with regard to grants. And in fact, we have even talked about uh, general fund balance and the lapse at the end of the year, as well as what makes up the general fund balance and the guidance for how much to retain in your fund balance. The sort of second to last slide here are some great resources for budget committees and selectmen on financing and budgeting. Um, obviously, we're a great resource for financing and budgeting. So not only answering municipal officials' questions directly, but we have the budget and finance workshop, which Steve already talked about, um, and we have the local officials workshop, which has already been talked about as well, and we have our book, Basic Law of Budgeting. So with that, and just to remind you again, as indicated on the last slide, we are a legal advisory service. About 60%, maybe 70% of our time is answering your questions. So any local elected or appointed official or town employee mm -hmm. can contact us. We left our cards here on the desk. Mm -hmm. It's legalinquiries at nhmunicipal.org. We also have a toll-free number, 800-852-3358. Uh, we generally get our answers back to you in writing or by telephone within a, about 24 hours. So that's also a resource that we can provide to you in your uh, difficult job uh, as a volunteer member of the budget committee. I have turn you in my little black book, and I've used the number, too. We'll turn it back over to the chair. Thank you so much. 832, I applaud your efforts in keeping it to, uh, to your time. You guys did a wonderful job, especially on condensing. Um, that presentation. Um, we did say that you guys would stick around for questions after the meeting was over. Um, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> sorry. I don't believe that we as a, a majority budget committee can discuss issues related to the budget committee outside of a meeting. Right. Putting 91A. Right. What we just learned in our presentation actually as well. We do know that the uh, NHMA is happy to entertain questions only off camera. So I would suggest that we simply turn the camera off and then continue. I think in order to turn the camera off, we would have to adjourn the meeting. No, not true. No. The, so the, still the, the chairman has control of the camera going on and off. <clears throat> if you instruct the camera crew to turn off the camera, they'll turn off the camera. But if they'll you turn do it back on when you tell them to turn it back on. But if you do that, you're still meeting. Yes, correct. And that's still in compliance with 91A. No, no. The 91A does not require the camera to be on. No, 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 Hang on one second. Hang on one second. Okay, six. Has no the, the, how are they going to take public? minutes? We would, have to, we would have to then be able to have the ability to administer minutes for the segment that was not broadcasted. Um, no, no, no. If we were still in a meeting without adjourning, we would have to have minutes for that because it would still be a meeting. The questions that are going to be asked um, as we are asking legal inquiries of the NHMA, I um, would prefer to adjourn the meeting and ask a legal inquiries in regards to the subject matter um, and have those inquiries be where they are town specific, um, kept with attorney client privilege. Um, either that or I can suggest that all questions be sent to me in writing and we will get them to NHMA in writing and I can forego a question and answer session altogether if that's not a good option as well but I figured that NHMA is here they um, they are here for us to ask questions they're a wonderful resource I would just recommend um, adjourning the meeting and asking the questions that we have. I will make a motion to adjourn the meeting. So I'll second questions. it. I'll Oops. second the discussion. I would open the table for discussion. Page six, you just got the pass out. 
Middle box, it's a lot of meetings. No, uh, bullet point two, budget committee governing body meetings, unlimited number, public meeting rule only, 91A. In other words, we don't want to adjourn the meeting because we're going to have a quorum here at the community. Absolutely. Room. And I make a motion we continue the meeting until we are completely finished with our presentation. Well, before I entertain your motion, we Mr. still have Jim. to hang on one second. I think that's an illegal meeting. We still have a illegal meeting is not a meeting with with a uh, council. That is not an illegal meeting. But the board is of not hold on. I'll oh, wait, Miss Wellesley. Oh. Miss Wellesley, the board of selectmen meet with council all the time, and they don't record those meetings. There is no minutes of those meetings because it is under attorney client privilege. We're not the board of chairman, man. I am suggesting that this board adjourn the meeting. We have a question session with council and then move on. Mr. Jones. In order for there to be an attorney client privilege invocation, there must be an attorney and their client. These people are not our attorneys. Right. We well, are let not. Me, let their me just client. jump in right there. Oh, good. We are we, not their client. We do have an attorney client relationship with the town of Hampton. Right. That right. is not true. with the budget committee itself. And budget committee is part of the town of Hampton. So all of our communications that we have with a community are covered by the attorney client privilege. And when you communicate with us to the legal advisory service or ask us questions in this situation, mm -hmm. that's covered by the attorney client privilege. That's a confidential relationship. There's no and doubt just, about that. And just to be very clear, Consultation with legal counsel is not a meeting under the right to know law. Okay. That being said, mm -hmm. uh, I have not finished. Uh, sure. If I understand the, the presentation by Steve, uh, he's claiming to be the attorney for the town of Hampton. No, I'm claiming that we have an attorney client relationship. Right. You are an attorney for the town of Hampton. I'm claiming we have an attorney client relationship. The attorney for the town of Hampton is the town attorney. Well, we have, you can have more than one attorney. We have an attorney client relationship. Right. That's all that's so necessary. So you're an attorney for the town of Hampton. Just I am I am the attorney for the town through the New Hampshire Municipal Association. Correct. Right. And under that basis, you're claiming that there is a, a an attorney client uh, relationship which can be accommodated under the non meeting clause of ninety one A. That is correct. So we can go into a non-meeting under 91A. Correct. We do not adjourn the meeting. We go into a non-meeting, correct? Okay, right. We would No, it would be a non-public no, no, session. When the Board of Selectmen does this, they do it by going into a non-meeting. They explicitly do not go and adjourn. They, mm -hmm. they do not adjourn. They call for a, a right. roll call vote to go into a non-meeting. Right. Am I not correct, Steve? Well, I think it, we're, we're, it's semantics here. I guess I would mm -hmm. say... Most people, of semantics. <laughs> most people think when you use the word adjourn is you are coming out of a public meeting. So I think it's more accurate to say when you adjourn, you come out of a public meeting and you enter some other activity which under the law is a non-meeting. So I think it's proper to say you're adjourning your public session mm -hmm. to go into a non-meeting for the purpose of consultation with legal counsel. Right, as long as we're clear we're not adjourning the meeting itself. Well, I, again, I... Because we're having a non-meet, right? Yeah. Semantics is everything. Miss Barnes. I make a motion to go into a non-meeting with I'll uh, legal that. counsel from NHMA. There's already two I'll motions on the table. We already have a motion. We already have one motion on the table. There's two. Um, well, you have the adjournment one that Brian made, and I second We're We're going to address the... And the one I made. Thank you. We can only have one at a time. <laughs> Just did this last night. Did you? <laughs> I would like to remind everybody that NHMA is on a time frame. They can only be here until 9 o'clock. Call for a vote. I am going to call for a vote on the motion that's on the table that has been seconded. The motion was made by Mr. Lapham and seconded by Mr. Uh, LeBranch to adjourn the meeting and um, go into a session of question and answer with the NHMA. And I'll be voting no on that in hopes that we can have a motion to go into a non-meeting. All those in favor of adjourning the meeting, uh, please keep your hands raised. I'm going to do an auditory what vote. What was the question again? Adjourn the meeting. Adjourn the meeting. Adjourn and go into a questions and answer session. Uh, Ms. Bridal, Ms. Barnes, Mr. Lapham, Mr. Clough, Chairman Bridal, Mr. LeBranch, Ms. Augustine, Mr. Henderson.
All those opposed? Mr. Pierce, Ms. Wolseley, those abstaining? I oppose. You oppose. Mr. Jones opposes as well. That being said, I will call the meeting adjourned at 8.40 p.m. Um, thank you so much, and I appreciate our guests coming out.